Good morning. How are you? How is everyone? We're back uh, with another installment and the, the last installment of the symposium. Um, what I'd like to look at now is uh, Phaedrus's, excuse me, Pausanias's speech and then Aristophanes' speech. Now, on the PowerPoint in the previous video, I gave you a chart that indicated all the speakers and their, um, their, their disciplines or professions, and then the various ways in which they talked about and thought about uh, Eros, the object of Eros and the effect of Eros. Um, so I'm not going to reference that now. I just have the PDF behind us so we can follow, and I'm going to read along a lot. Pausanias' speech, I really think, is actually the most complicated speech in the entire uh, symposium. It, and it actually turns out to be, it, despite some of the things he says and despite actually uh, some things that emerge about him, I think this is the most interesting speech. And it um, it actually points in all the directions of the, all the other speeches, pick up. All the speeches are really woven together and they... Uh, one character will make an assertion about something and not really follow it through to its conclusion, and another character will pick up that theme. And Pausanias' speech, speech is fascinating because it has bound within it really all the themes of the text. Um, so, so I want to talk about right now some of the key elements, and I'm not going to have notes here. You're going to have to follow along, going to de be derived from the text. Um, the, the key elements, the key themes involved in pa Pausanias' speech. The first thing that should be noted is that he follows Phaedrus' lead in telling a myth, right? He tells a myth, and it's a creation myth. And he says, oh, Phaedrus, and this is, remember, this is a competition. He's got to put Phaedrus in his place now, both in terms of the quality, but he makes a few jibes. Says, Phaedrus, oh, you know, that that was a, a, a wonderful uh, you know, myth, but sorry, but you left some things out. And he redoes this creation story and says, you didn't understand. There's, there's not one eros. There's two plural ero erotes, erotes. There's two types of love. There is heavenly love and there is vulgar, or you could say earthly love. And, um, let's just be clear right now. The heavenly love is uh, love of the soul, or love based on the soul, and the earthly love is bodily love, and it's a.k.a. sex, right? So Pausanias' speech, along with Aristophanes, actually are the two speeches that really hit upon sex in a fairly explicit way, and there's some funny things said here. So he establishes these two kinds. One is an animal love, and of course it's not... It's part of the human experience because we're animals, but it's not a fully human form of love because it doesn't engage our minds, our souls, our intellect, our reason. Uh, and then the higher form, the heavenly love, is a type of love for the soul that produces goods of the soul, which is to say virtue, which is to say moral and intellectual virtue. So once that's established, he then talks about the relationship between love and morality and politics. The first thing that becomes that he is a, a gentleman, he's a kind of nobleman uh, of, of high birth who's a politician. So what's what are his concerns? He has moral and political concerns in relationship to sex, right? And that alone highlights the fact that the love human beings experience in contradistinction to animals is really defined not just by biological impulse, DNA, sexual impulse to, for procreation and reproduction, but rather um, uh, is surrounded by a whole set of cultural rules and norms that you might say make love and sex what it actually is. If human beings were like barn animals, we probably don't spend much time thinking about sex, either because we don't have the ability to, or because it's really quite simple. It's mechanical. It is barn animals behind the barn doing their thing. They're breeding, right? When we get together, we don't say, oh, honey, I'd really like to breed with you this evening, right? And you can immediately see the difference. Uh, same with uh, the, the horse and the saddle. Uh, the saddle goes on the horse, not on the human being. The human being isn't ridden by the horse. These things seem to be ridiculous. But this makes a really basic point that 
what we really understand by love is not old, um, but in fact it's young. Now he again presents the better form of love as old, more ancient, more dignified, more worthy of respect. But if love is really about norms, we know if we're looking at the natural history of the human species that it's actually new, it's more recent, because uh, the more ancient element is actually uh, the, the just the sexual procreation. So he establishes concerns for morality and performing deeds where we either feel pride or shame at our deeds, right? And of course, uh, elements surrounding eros are very pro provocative of positive and negative feelings about oneself, all kinds of reasons. The other thing is that eros, sex, love, uh, shrouded in all kinds of taboos and boundaries, right? That uh, create a tremendous amount of longing. Eros is longing, right? And it is that longing for things or for people that endow the object of our desire with such great meaning and such great worth. Now, he's explicitly concerned with love between human beings. So it's a very intelligible speech for us compared to, say, Socrates' speech, which is rather odd because his eros is not for other human beings. So then he talks about different types of civilizations in Greece and Boeotia and the way they carry themselves in their erotic relationship. He doesn't get into details, right? But he says uh, one society is very sophisticated and has sophisticated speech, the, and the other is very simple. Um, he says they're not well spoken, and he says that translates into their etiquette and their degree of civility as, as it sounds the, surrounds the rituals, the institutions, the rules of uh, intimate relationships. And we're almost talking about romantic relationships here. Um, then he talks about the Persians and the way in which, compared to the Greeks who encourage love relationships people, the, the, the society of Greece, the way of life, the politeia, the, the laws of the society, the moral codes, encourage intense bonds of love between people, fraternal bonds of, of very, and, and other types of bonds, where, and it, because it's a free society. And the foundation of a free society is, is strong connections between human beings. But Persia is a tyranny, and the strategy there is to divide and conquer. And this is an interesting motif because I've mentioned already that we're going to see this concern for tyranny's strategy of divide and conquer again in 1984, and it's literally going to divide and conquer a love relationship. And the logic therein is that by dividing people, you make them weak. They're not dependent on each other. They're now dependent on the state. And when they're dependent on the state, the state can control them. And it's a, it's a simple control mechanism because they're not given the freedom to uh, self-sufficiently uh, carry out and satisfy the demands of their own lives themselves. Then he, this is important, the next step, he moves into a discussion of this lover and beloved relationship that is discussed in the introduction to the text. So if you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to read the introduction, the Eronimos and the Erastes, the beloved and the lover. And this is an interesting relationship because, first of all, we see it as a reflection of what Aristotle said relationships are, which is uh, modes of exchange, certain types of goods, it's not necessarily the case that what's exchanged is the same from one person to the other. I get one from thing from you, you get a different thing from me, and we both are looking for the thing that the other person has, so the exchange works until that breaks down and then the relationship dissolves. Now, the lover-beloved relationship, I suppose, could be one of equals, but it tends to be portrayed as one that's not among equals. The beloved is presented in a higher position to the lover because the lover is pursuing them and there's a certain type of desperation involved uh, and we think of really we're talking about the chase here and then what he does is to talk about this institution uh, this pederastic institution between an older man and a younger boy in which what the older man, what do they get out of it? It's an exchange, right? What, what do they get out of this relationship? Uh, the older man gets the beauty of youth, 
of the young the younger boy the the appeal of it and what does the younger boy get uh Pausanias says uh wisdom right and the relationship is presented something like a teacher student relationship it's something like a mentorship uh and I'll say more about the institution in ancient Greece in a moment and uh, as part of it is an erotic relationship uh such that through this relationship wisdom is gained now we come back to this question from uh Agathon uh does wisdom really come from sex how is it this boy gets wisdom this young young male he's on the verge of being a a, a man um so the age difference it, it's not like it's entirely young but there is an issue with the youth the age and plato makes it sure to point that out um, does the young boy really get wisdom from this relationship? It's not clear. And we know what the old man gets. He gets the pleasure of the beauty of youth, and he gets the pleasure of sex, right? And so you see that the exchange is incommensurate. What they're getting is not the same thing. A little bit about the institution. This was an institution that developed, particularly in the 5th century BC, in ancient Athens and other Greek city-states, between an older man of a certain status, wealth, uh, and a younger boy from a good family, or a younger man, I should say, who is, in a sense, being preened for a political life, and they're establishing a kind of connection. This person becomes a gateway uh, into politics because you need allies, as Plato has said, and they become a mentor in facilitating this kind of transition into the life of grown men. Uh, it involved a sexual component. Um, the men, this is not, this is not what we would call like a, a gay relationship. We have to separate out something here, which is that on one hand, um, this was an institution engaged in by men who had families. It was obligatory, regardless of what your orientation was in Greek society or any ancient society. You have to have a family. You have to reproduce. The city, the political community demands that its citizens reproduce themselves because that becomes an existential threat uh, to the city that ha has to have population, especially an elite population, a population within the division of labor. Uh, so even if you had a natural inclination to be a homosexual, for example, um, you would still be obliged to have a family. So this institution, in fact, was engaged in by people, you would say, of varying um, sexual orientations, right? And it turns out in the course of this drama that probably some of these men not only engage in this practice, but are also basically like we would consider today homosexual, right? And... Um, The question becomes is, what, what is the justice behind? What, what is the value of this relationship? Is it what Pausanias presents it as? Pausanias presents himself as a, a man of great character and, and status, as a decent man. And he talks about the rules of this relationship. And he says there's a problem in our society. There's a bunch of people giving this relationship a bad name. And why are they giving it a bad name? Because they're engaged, book nine of the Nicomachean Ethics, they're engaged in deceiving the boy. They say, I'm going to be your mentor. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you a leg up in society. Come here on my casting couch, right? And what it's really about for the man is exploiting the naivete of the young to get them in bed, right? Now, that seems like an obvious problem. And what's his concern? He wants to have strict rules on the institution, not for the sake of the young men and protecting, uh, you know, their, their well-being, but rather to make sure that this institution has a good image because there's clearly people out there in Greek society in Athens who uh, are uncomfortable with it, which leads us into the obvious discussion. I mean, isn't this a kind of pedophilia? And let's just say that this relationship really borders in a very ambiguous place. The uh, 
a couple important things that distinguish it from a real kind of a situation of like a, an abuse, right? First is that this relationship would have been carried on in public, which is to say the parents of the children would have had full knowledge and, and this relationship would have been kind of set up and brokered by them. Uh, second of all, the young man is a young man. We're not talking about uh, a kid here, a little kid. We're talking about uh, a teenager. Right. And it's described as someone who's like almost about to have, you know, a full beard and things like that. Nonetheless, they're clearly young and they're clearly vulnerable to being exploited by older men who know the world and who know how to take advantage of innocence. Right. And this raises uh, this basic question of consensuality, right, that comes into play with love and uh, with friendship. Um, our society. Uh, in a good way, and also in a slightly perverse way, uh, is, um, is uh, you know, this concern for consensuality is at uh, the, the center of things um, for, like, almost legal reasons. But it really should be uh, as a matter of respecting your own self-worth. I mean, to put yourself in a situation, I mean, bad things happen to people. Uh, but uh, for most of us, uh, on the on the whole, um, I mean, to put yourself in a situation where you're not fully consenting uh, is normally something that a person with experience knows learns how to avoid. Although there are of course serious serious exceptions, but the problem is, what's the issue with consent? I mean, why, for example, uh, is there an age of consent in which you sleep with a person who's under age, and that is against the law? It's, it's called statutory rape. Well, it has to do with their ability to consent. The law, and based on thousands of years of practice, right, in terms of discriminating the stages of our own um, cognitive and, and psychological development, it basically sees that a person of a certain age is not capable of giving full consent because when they're presented with a situation, they're not able to uh, process it sufficiently rationally and determine their own self-interest. Right. They and they could be more easily deceived as a wrong, wrong person and any any variety of things here. So Pausanias, this is going to be really crucial. He says he wants to protect the well-being of the, the younger, the younger man. But I think if we look very closely, what he really wants to do is to protect this institution so he can continue to have access to it and enjoy the pleasures of the body, right? And that exposes him as a kind of hypocrite. And who are the best and most royal hypocrites in any society? They are the ones who present themselves as the most morally righteous of, of among us. Um, those you trust the most may also be the ones who are most corrupt. And it's a, it's a Gyges ring, right? presenting and maintaining the reputation of moral righteousness so then nobody would suspect that you're doing awful things and then when they actually come out nobody even believes the statements because oh this person oh you know he's so so um, pious or you know whatever it may be okay and and in fact in exposing the way this speech is crafted is really it's very subtle but it's there is really designed to expose Pausanias's hypocrisy and if you can see that in it um, it's really quite amusing so let's begin at the beginning the speech of Pausanias Phaedrus I'm not quite sure our subject has been well defined what does that mean Phaedrus has failed to define it well a charge has been simply to speak in praise of love this would have been fine if love himself were simple, too. But as a matter of fact, there are two kinds of love. So when he means simple here, he, he doesn't mean easy. He means not complex. It turns out love is not simple, but it is complex, and there are two kinds. And why is that? It is because the human being is complex, right? We have a body and a soul, and the two types of love match up to love of the soul and love of the body. He says, in view of this, it might be better to begin by making clear what kind of love we are to praise. 
Let me therefore try to put our discussion back on the right track and explain which kind of love ought to be praised. Then I shall give him the praise he deserves, as he is a god. So a very pious beginning, showing respect for the deity, showing respect for the context, which is essentially a religious context. It is, we is a well-known fact that love and Aphrodite are inseparable. If therefore Aphrodite were a single goddess, there could also be a single love. But since there are actually two goddesses of that name, there are also two kinds of love. So there are two origins of Eros, a heavenly Aphrodite and a vulgar or an earthly or common Aphrodite. I don't expect you'll disagree with me about the two goddesses, will you? Of course, if he agrees, that undermines the argument that uh, Phaedrus made. One is an older deity, the motherless daughter of Uranus, the god of heaven. She is known as Urania, or heavenly Aphrodite. The other goddess is younger, the daughter of Zeus and Dione. Her name is Pandemos, or common Aphrodite. It follows, therefore, that there is a common as well as a heavenly love. And we could just say that this is an earthly versus a heavenly, or this is a bodily love versus a love of the soul, depending on which godness is love's partner. And although, of course, all the gods must be praised, we must still make an effort to keep these two gods apart. He even seems to be implied that certain gods or goddesses are worthy of more praise. The reason for this applies in the same way to every type of action considered in itself. No action is either good or bad, honorable or shameful. So we should point out some interest. Notice again, he transitions from this creation myth, and here he doesn't begin at the very, he doesn't say in the beginning when there was a void. He starts with the existence of the mother of Eros. So he's confining the myth and focusing in in a way. And then once he tells the creation myth of Eros, the two types of Eros, he immediately flips to our, the, the human realm and our concerns, which really turn out to be his concerns, right? But I want to point out something really interesting here. Heavenly love, it's not sexual love. It transcends the body. It's about the soul. It's a higher love. We got it, right? Now notice how heavenly Aphrodite that produces heavenly Eros is created. She is the uh, motherless uh, he, uh, Aphrodite produced by Urani, Uranus, right? The motherless daughter of Uranus. So how is she created? Two things are relevant here. Number one, she's not created through sexual reproduction, male and female, right? And then she's created by the man, right? Um, what do you think this man's preferences are? Do you think he prefers men or do you think he prefers women, right? The male power of creation. You need only open Genesis to see God creating, right? And then uh, Eve is created out of Adam's rib. Men are given the power of creation. So you've already seen where he's going with this just in this opening para second paragraph here, and you, you, you'll miss that otherwise, right? And then, of course, common Aphrodite, right, is the result of sexual procreation between a male and a woman, and then it's going to re reflect that status. And what is he going to say? He's going to say the male-male relationship in its very nature is about heavenly love. Of course, he undermines that in the third paragraph where he says, any action in and of itself, is neither good or bad, but rather it's how it's done. And of course, in this he's correct, right? A certain action is neither virtuous nor base. It's how well you perform the action, right? I mean, I don't know. Shooting a basketball, is it well or good? Well, it depends how you shoot the basketball. And obviously, this is going to have to, this has to do with the theme of how we carry out love. Is love good or bad? It's neither. It's good if it's done properly. And for him, he's going to claim that it's this heavenly uh, love. Now, one more note. The common Aphrodite is called Aphrodite Pandemos. Pan, like pandemonium or pandemic. Heard that word recently. Um, pan means like all or everything. 
right? Demos means people. Commonly, it's common because everybody has this. And I think there are two connotations here. The first, the most direct one is common love is vulgar love. It is sexual love, something that's common to everyone. But I think also he's interesting. Aristophanes is going to do the same thing. They're going to demote. They're going to demote sexual and relationships between men and women, right? And the, the sexual relationship is connected with pro procreation, right? And why is that? Why is that? Because relationships between men and women, for him, I think, and Aristophanes, are founded on the procreative function. And male-male relationships, they transcend the procreative function because they cannot produce children. But they may produce other things, higher things. Of course, it turns out that relationship that relationship is not the exclusive one that produces. But it, the logic of it becomes clear. Here we have men getting together speaking and talking and of course there's some gender associations that i think we probably wouldn't agree with here okay so heavenly and earthly love and of course pausanias he is a practitioner of heavenly love i mean that's obvious right that's obvious he says the reason for this applies to the same every type of action considered in itself no action is either good or bad honorable or shameful take for example Choice between singing, drinking, or having conversation. That's their, their choice. Now, in itself, none of these is better than the other, right? All these things could be potentially good, and all these things could be potentially bad. It depends on how it's done. Uh, how it comes out depends entirely on how it's performed. Now, what are we really concerned with? Not the performance of music or drinking. We're concerned with the performance of love. And if we're talking about earthly love or pandemos, common love, how is it performed it has to do with performing the sex act, right? So he doesn't make that clear, but that's clearly an implication of what he said. And it's, it's kind of funny. Of course, the higher form of love, love of souls, is, actually sounds a lot like complete friendship. And what he pretends to purport to show us is that this uh, relationship between the older man and young boy is really a complete friendship, right? If it is done honorably and properly, it turns out to be honorable. Think about that for a second next time. If it is done improperly, it is disgraceful. And my point is that exactly this principle applies to being in love or even making love. Now, honorable or disgraceful, it has to do with what rules, what codes of conduct, how you've carried yourself, and that has to do with the rules. Love is not in himself noble and worthy of praise. Now, he's just contradicted himself. He said, I'm making a speech in praise of Eros. And now he says, love is not an end in himself. Right? He's, it's how he's performed and the consequences of it. And, he, and that he's not even willing to give praise. That depends on whether the sentiments he produces in us are themselves noble. He's made a claim that Socrates will pick up, that love is just a means to an end, and what matters is the type, the types of things it inspires in us, the, the objects of our desire and its effects. So Eros turns out to be a means, and actually that is not praise, that is actually a kind of criticism, because Eros turns out to be just a means. He says, now the cow and Aphrodite, love, uh, love is himself truly common, and he doesn't like it. As such, he strikes whenever he gets a chance. I think everybody can figure out what he's saying there. This, of course, is the love felt by the vulgar, and Pausanias is not vulgar, right? Um, who are attached to women. Now, notice that. He says the vulgar, and what we first seem to think he must mean is just people who see love only in the form of sex that sex and love are synonymous and that there's nothing higher than that, right? But he particularly associates it for men, because he's speaking from the male point of view, who are attracted to women. So he's trying to denigrate the male-female relationship. Now let's be clear, this is not Plato speaking, this is the character speaking. And in fact, I think uh, Plato disagrees with a number of things he says. Uh, it's particularly 
true of those who are attached to women no less than to boys, to the body more than the, to those of the soul, and to the least intelligent partners, since all they care about is completing the sexual act. I think we can all figure out what he's saying there. Whether they do it honorably or not is of no concern. That is why they do whatever comes their way, sometimes good, sometimes bad. These people are giving in to their passions, right? This is The passions are constantly generated. In one moment they want this, and another moment they want that. And and which one it, it is incidental, incidental to their purpose. For the love who moves them uh, belongs to a much younger goddess, uh, who, though her parentage partakes of the nature of both the male, the female and the male. Contrast this with heavenly love, this goddess whose descent is purely male, therefore it's superior in his eyes. Hence, this love is for boys, is considerably older, which means more dignified, with more authority, more traditional authority. Uh, it's considerably older, and therefore free from the lewdness of youth. That's odd, because this person's pursuing the young. That's why those who are inspired by her love are attracted to the male. They find pleasure uh, in what is by nature stronger and more intelligent. So he's got a sex bias here, right? Um, but even within the group that is attracted to handsome boys, do you think he's attracted to handsome boys? You think you figure out what he has on his mind, what he likes and what he's done isn't like? It's pretty clear. Some are not moved, moved purely by this heavenly love. Those uh, who are who. Those who are do not fall in love with little boys. They prefer older ones whose cheeks are showing the first traces of a beard, a sign that they have begun to form minds of their own. All right, so that's really crucial because he says the person with the more dignified form of love doesn't doesn't take advantage of the young ones, but finds one who is, who's basically just about of age who has formed their own mind, and therefore they can do what? They can consent. There's a whole concept... Uh, the developed kind of intellectual history of something called the age of reason. And the age of reason is basically the period in a human being's life where their mind has matured sufficiently enough to be able to make decisions autonomously, independent of the kind of the guidance of, um, you know, teachers or parents. And that's why, for example, parents have custodianship over kids until they reach a certain age. And then once the kids are 18, they are free to do all kinds of things that they could be prevented from doing by their parents prior to that. I am convinced that a man who falls in love with a young man of this age is generally prepared to share everything with the one he loves. He is eager, in fact, to spend the rest of his own life with him. Now think about that. An older man with a younger boy. This precisely does not seem like a relationship that is going to endure for the duration of one's life. What happens when the younger boy gets older? Is he not going to replicate this relationship with someone younger as part of promoting this whole uh, institution? Uh, I don't see this relationship as, as enduring, having duration, right? Um, it doesn't he makes it out to be something like complete friendship, but it does not seem to be in fact. He certainly uh, does not aim to deceive him. He certainly does not aim to deceive him. What's the problem? The younger man is easily deceived. The fact that he's even having to say this suggests that maybe Pausanias has deceived some young boys at one time or another doesn't deceive him to take advantage of him while he's still young. And, of course, there's the problem. And inexperienced. And then, after exposing him to really ridicule, to move quickly on to someone else. I think that's all fairly self-explanatory. You meet you, greet you, and drop you. Right? I've gotten what I want, and I'm going to move on. And I'm going to argue that that is exactly what Pausanias does, or likely does. And that he's using the the high talk of morality and heavenly love to create a kind of Gyges ring, a kind of veneer over of respectability. And he's a hypocrite, right? Hypocrite. What's, what's the line that um, hypocrisy is the homage vice pays to virtue, 
think about that for a moment. Um, as a matter of fact, there should be a law forbidding affairs with young boys. Now, does that sound good? What, what I'd like us to, I want to entertain you to do is when he says something, question, do you agree or disagree? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Right? Um, based on our own experience, right? We all have varying degrees of experience to be able to assess what he's saying here. Should there be a law forbidding affairs with younger boys? I think if we just looked at it objectively, the answer would be yes, because the younger are the innocent people who are, could be exploited. And if you don't have laws, you don't have walls and boundaries to restrict people's conduct. And they will do it if they think they can get away with it without any consequences. Right? Because just telling people that they should have good character is never enough. So he actually agrees with this. And he takes this idea. If nothing else, all the time and effort would not be wasted on such an uncertain pursuit. And what is more uncertain than whether a particularly whether a particular boy will eventually make something of himself physically or mentally. Good men, of course, are willing to make a law like this for themselves, but those other lovers, the vulgar ones, need external restraint. Right? What does he say? Good guys, they regulate their own conduct. They're self-regulating. And I, I think, is this true or false? This, of course, is true. We give, a, a good person gives laws to themselves, they follow the rules, and therefore they don't need the police showing up at their door, right? And he says it's the vulgar one who is the one in need of external restraint, and the vulgar one is engaged in the bodily love, and that they're really exploit, they're de what he's already established it. They're deceiving the young person about what they're going to get. He claims it's going to be mentorship, they're going to get wisdom, he says that later on. But in fact, he's just using that as a ruse to get what he wants, right? And we looked at Book 9 of the uh, Nicomachean Ethics, in which Aristotle explains how this whole process of deception and self-deception works, because we all want stuff, and therefore we want to believe that the thing we're getting is actually what we wanted, and we haven't actually, and it turns out very often that's not the case, or in, it, it's not always the case, because our hopes have uh, deceived us. Uh, for just this reason, we have placed every possible legal, uh, legal, legal obstacle to their seducing our own wives and daughters. Okay, so this starts to explain. So there are legal prohibitions uh, against... Um, there are strong legal prohibitions against marital infidelity, sleeping with another man's wife. So what was the solution in this society? Uh, the solution was this male-male relationship. This is the way they're going to uh, satisfy themselves sexually in a way that doesn't disrupt the social order of the home, right? So, in fact, this institution seems to be all about sex, right? That's kind of odd. These vulgar lovers are the people who have given love such a bad reputation that some have gone so far as to claim that taking any man as a lover is, is in itself disgraceful. Would anyone make this claim if he weren't thinking of how hasty vulgar lovers are, and therefore how unfair to their loved ones? For nothing done properly and in accordance with our customs uh, would ever have provoked such righteous disapproval. Right. So what is he now doing? He's actually trying to defend this institution that he partakes of on the grounds that it's being abused to exploit young, younger, younger men or younger children, right? And uh, true or false, it sounds like it's probably a problem, right? But he says, good men follow our customs and it should never provoke this kind of disapproval that the that people who are opponents who don't like this institution are involved in. So he brings in the issue of custom. The Greek word for custom is nomos. Nomos means either custom or law. So that's what he's been talking about. The laws, the rules, the boundaries, the walls surrounding how relationships are conducted. And partly what we're talking about is not just um, rules, but the procedures by which relationships are carried out. Um, less so in my generation, 
uh, you'd probably have to go back to my parents' generation, where when people were engaging in relationships as young people and love relationships and boyfriend, girlfriend, and, and so on and so forth, society at that time really had a clear understanding of how these relationships were carried out in a way uh, in, in order to have a clear set of rules and that certain conduct signaled certain things about the status of the relationship, right? And it, it's a kind of filter mechanism to inhibit people being taken advantage of, right? I mean, in the 60s and 70s, the great period of liberation, right? Everybody said, oh, these rules are so bourgeois, and they're so restrictive and repressive and all this. We just need free love. We need to do what our passions dictate. And really, these rules are in place not to make everybody prudes, but to protect, protect their innocence and to protect um, them from being taken advantage of. It's quite, quite reasonable, actually. And what he's going to do eventually is to spell out some rules that should be in place. Um, but the argument I'm going to make is that the rules he wants to put in place are really to give a veneer of justification so he can keep doing what he's doing. The politicians today do the same thing. They say, oh my God, this thing is awful. We're going to pass legislation to this, the blight of poverty or the blight of this or blight of that. And they pass some legislation called, you know, saving the world from poverty, right? And then what it actually does is it uh, exploits the poor people and gives more to the rich. Um, it, that kind of stuff happens all the time because in, in legislation, the devil's always in the details. But he's talking about the rules. And from there, he talks about different societies that have different customs associated with love or with sex, really, because that's really... He's really focusing on sex, even though he says this is beneath him and this is vulgar. And these societies' customs seem to be based on, he says, some are more articulate and inarticulate, right? Articulate, you're able to speak well in a sophisticated way. Inarticulate it, you're simple, you're kind of a bumpkin. You don't speak in a sophisticated, clear way with precise meaning and kind of, kind of sense of decorum or dignity. But I think what he's really hitting at here is the issue of reason and speech, logos. There are those societies that um, make love, because it's complicated, a sophisticated thing, that have rituals with rules, right? What does logos do? It spells out what is right and wrong. And then there are other societies that are like more primitive, they're more basic, and they seem to believe in more of like, uh, because they're not sophisticated, in a kind of free love right? And they, they don't have all the unusual taboos and boundaries and codes of conduct surrounding sex. And there's certainly some truth. I mean, it can be overstated, uh, you know, the distinction in civilization from more primitive to more civilized societies. And oftentimes it turns out that primitive societies are not that uh, primitive. They're just, they're just different uh, in appearance from, say, Western society. But there are certainly some societies that simply treat sex in a more basic, a more primitive way with less discretion, less rules. Uh, and it turns out those rules are there for good reason, right? To protect people and also facilitate happiness as a result of protecting them. And I think one thing I want to raise now is the fundamental questioning uh, that our society has been pushing the kind of free love attitude. Even today, they don't talk about it, free love, but... Really, they say, whatever you do, whatever it is, is okay. And in many ways, that is uh, that makes sense because it allows us, it's part of American freedom, it allows us to be who we are. On the other hand, uh, the freedom to hurt someone else or to not have any boundaries, right? Um, or to hurt yourself, right? Um, because Eros is such a sensitive thing, it, it's the cause of great happiness and also great unhappiness, right? Uh, Rousseau will touch on that. So, articulate and inarticulate. He says, I should point this out, however, that all the customs, nomos, the rules regarding love in most cities are simple and easy to understand. Here in Athens, as well as Sparta, they are remarkably complex. Why? Because we're complex beings, not just with bodies, but also with souls, right? And that love is about both things, not just one. So therefore they're complex. It's just reflecting human nature that they're complex. In places where the people are inarticulate, like Elias and Boeotia, 
Tradition straightforwardly approves taking a lover in every case. So they're indiscriminate. They don't make discretion about, oh, if, if there's someone there, if there's grass on the field to play, you play, right? And that doesn't sound like, you know, think about it. Friends are best friends because they're scarce. There's only a few. If one is indiscriminate in uh, giving out their, um, in sharing their sexuality, you're devaluing yourself and you're going to feel that devaluing and so is the person you're with. They're going to be sensitive to that. So it's an argument for why you don't just indiscriminately sleep with everybody. No one uh, there, young or old, would consider it shameful. So shame and morality. So rules make certain behaviors shameful. You feel bad that you've done them. Also, it makes it provocative, right? So in sex, there's this whole issue of having the rules and breaking the rules and the provocation of breaking the rules and the thrill of that. So it cuts both ways. The reason, I suspect, is that being poor speakers, inarticulate, uh, they want to save themselves the trouble of having to offer reasons and arguments in support of their suits. So he sees as the lover goes to the beloved and they make an argument. They use words, let's say, to, I mean, it sounds very legalistic here, but let's say they use words to seduce them, right? And that whole courtship process, what we're really talking about here, involves speech before we ever get to the bedroom. And we know why, because that speech period of courtship is a filter mechanism. You separate from the wheat from the chaff, and in particular, there's one thing really key you discover, which is the true intentions of the person you're interacting with. Uh, by contrast, in places like Ionia, in almost every part of the Persian Empire, empire, tyranny, Taking a lover is always considered disgraceful. The Persian Empire is absolute. That is why it condemns love, as well as philosophy and sport. So I think philosophy and sport are actually things that bring people together in intense camarader camaraderie and comradeship, and they want to inhibit that type, those type of bonds of loyalty. It is no good for rulers... Remember, the rulers, Thrasymachus told us, the rulers rule in their own interest, right? It is no good for the rulers, and they make laws that are in their own interest, and then they tell you that they're in your interest, right? It's kind of an important thing to remember in the real world. If the people they rule cherish ambitions for themselves or form strong bonds of friendship with one another, that's so those are negatives. Ambitious people who are bound tightly to others, are a threat to the ruler. We'll see that explicitly in Aristophanes' speech. That these are precisely the effects of philosophy and sport, and especially love, which is to say they bring people together, and is a lesson of the tyrant, tyrants of Athens learned directly from their own experience. Didn't their reign come to a dismal end because of the bond uniting Harmodius and Aristogiton in love and affection? So he tells, actually brings up a historical example. Two characters, Harmodius and Aristogiton. You can go see sculptures. You Google it. You'll find some sculptures of these two characters. Uh, historical figures called the Tyrannocides. Tyrannocides, like homicide, but uh, tyrannicide, which is to say people who killed the tyrant. And here he claims they did it because they were in this bonded relationship that gave them the ambition to want to topple the uh, despotic ruler. So here you see the serious implications of love in terms of political order. And this is no joke. And this is I highlight this precisely because it's not what we're thinking about. We naturally think about love as behind closed doors, hanging out, eating popcorn, uh, watching a romantic comedy, right? Well, there's serious public implications of the rules surrounding love and how it facilitates or does not facilitate relationships. He says... So you can see the plain condemnation of love reveals lust for power in the rulers. The condemnation of love reveals lust for power. That is a most powerful insight. You look at our society today, and you tell me, I, and it's an open question, I ask, obviously my opinion is somewhat shaped, and you can see it, but 
does our society promote, let's just say, wholesome relationships, happy, wholesome relationships between human beings? I mean, look at the music industry. Look at the film industry. Look at the perspective. Now, do politicians come out and explicitly talk about shaping people's relationships? No, they don't. But they certainly talk about men and women and rules and laws surrounding men and women uh, get, being the most dominant relationship and still procreation, sitting at the center of that. Um, uh, I would say, at least my general observation, is that they are more inclined to cultivate a battle of the sexes that is not so healthy or wholesome. So the condom lay... And what does this reveal about our leaders, about our politicians? The condemnation of love reveals the lust for power in the rulers and the cowardice of the rule. It tells us something about us. Uh, while indiscriminate approval testifies to general dullness and stupidity. Our own customs, which as I already said, are much more difficult to understand, are also far superior. Now he's going to talk about Athenian custom in this relation, this pederastic relation. Recall, for example, that we consider it more honorable to declare your love rather than to keep it a secret, especially if you're in love with a young, a youth of good family and accomplishment, even if he isn't all that beautiful. <laughs> Recall also that a lover is encouraged in every possible way. Uh, this means uh, that what he does is not considered shameful. So this is going to be interesting, the use of shame. Shame inhibits behavior, praise promotes behavior, right? It's a very simple logic of um, positive and negative reinforcement. So the uh, lover is going to be, in his point of view, permitted to do virtually anything to try to get the beloved. And nothing is considered shameful even when his behavior might be shameful. He's going to say it shouldn't be considered shameful because uh, the lover is being courageous and throwing themselves out there. And we, we allow, he says, we allow things in love that we wouldn't allow in other things. People can act a little ridiculous in love and we all understand it. Whereas if they were just trying to buy a car or something, we'd find them, we'd find them outrageous. But what does this set up? Uh, this sets up a logic where the pursuer, the older man, can do whatever he wants to try to get the younger, and he's going to say it's acceptable. Well, is that acceptable? It's absolutely not acceptable, because that's going to lead to the very exploitation that he claims that he's trying to avoid through the creation of specific rules to inhibit those, those kind of issues. He says, and as for attempts at conquest, our custom is to praise lovers for totally extraordinary acts, so extraordinary, and let's be clear, the lover pursues the beloved. The beloved is this kind of passive object that sits there and is chased. So we're talking about a courtship, we're talking about a chase that is not reciprocal. It goes in one direction. In the same way, everyone, Socrates is the beloved of all the characters, and the interesting thing is he doesn't really love anybody. And he doesn't, he, like I said, he doesn't harm them, he's just not that interested. In fact, uh, in fact, that if they performed them for any other purpose, whatever, they would reap the most profound contempt. Suppose, for example, that in order to secure money or a public post, a job, or any other kind of practical benefit uh, from another person, a man were willing to do what lovers do uh, for the ones they love. And what they what do they do trying to get the ones they love? They do cray cray stuff. They do crazy stuff. And this goes back to Eros as a drug. It has dramatic effects on people. It's a powerful drug. It's a potentially dangerous drug. So in other things, it's not okay. But in love, apparently, it's it's okay to be a little bit loony, a little bit wacky. Imagine that in pressing his suits. He went to his knees in public view and begged in the most humiliating way that he swore all sorts of vows, that he spent the night uh, at the other man's doorstep, that he, he were anxious to provide services even a slave would have refused. Well, you can be sure that everyone, everyone, his enemies no less than his friends, would stand in his way if he did all those ridiculous things for a public post or money. But let a lover act 
in any of these ways, and everyone will immediately say, what a charming man he is. What a charming man he is. <coughs> no blame, no shame, attaches to his behavior, custom, the laws, the rules, treat it as noble through and through. Now, Pausanias has just pulled a fast one on you, if you think what he's just described is acceptable, right? He is flipping what is noble and what is base. A person doing anything, even in love, is not appropriate. Yes, the standards are different from getting money to love. But if you act that ridiculous, if you put yourself out there in that way, then what does it mean about the love you have to begin with? Right? And then he says, it's not shameful, but it's noble. No, the real answer is what he's describing is potentially shameful. And what is even more remarkable is that at least according to popular wisdom, the gods will forgive a lover even for breaking his vows. Now, wait a second. Breaking his vows, that's keeping your promises. That's being honest and being loyal. And the lover is the older one. Breaking his vows? Well, that's another way of saying of deceiving them. You claimed you were going to do this, and then you backed out of it. Now, it's deception when you know you're going to back out of your vow, your, your oath to begin with, right? And what's the vow? We all know what the vow is. I love you, honey. I'm with you, honey, right? And I'm not leaving you, honey, for someone else. And then the vow's broken. Oh, sorry, honey, I'm gone. There's another one out there, and my passions have directed me in that way. And yesterday it was you, today it's them. That's how it goes, right? He's saying it's okay to break vows. Well, it's, it's precisely not okay to break vows if he wants to maintain this dignified relationship that he talks about. A lover's vow, uh, uh, our people say, is no vow at all. And guess what? <laughs> he doesn't have a problem with that. And, of course, we should have a problem with that if we want good relationships. The freedom given to the lover by both gods and men, according to our custom, is immense. Right? It's like the powers of the presidency. Um, basically, he's saying, in order to court the young man, the lover can not only does do whatever they want, but they do do it, and it should be acceptable. They ought to be able to do it. Now, does that sound reasonable? No, it sounds totally unreasonable because it will be the it will be the source of exploitation by definition. One of the things they can clearly be permitted to do, let's be clear, is to deceive the young man and to exploit them in precisely the way he claims that he does not want to exploit them. He is now setting up rules that allow rules and regulations that allow for the exploitation of the young. But he he says it in such a nice official way that it sounds like he's saying a good thing, and he's not. <clears throat> in view of all this, we might well conclude that in our city we consider the lover's desire and the willingness to satisfy it as the noblest thing in the world. Right? What if he's talking about sexual desire here? The lover's desire to, let's be crude, to get laid is the most noble desire in the world. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, I don't think so. And if you act that way to get what you want, it definitely um, does not seem noble, let alone the noblest. When, on the other hand, you recall that fathers hire attendants for their sons as soon as they're old enough to be attractive, and that an attendant's main task is to prevent any contact between his charge and his suitors, when you recall how mercilessly a boy's own friends tease him if they catch him at it, and how strongly their elders approve and even encourage such mocking. What does mocking do? It discourages people from acting on, on their passionate impulses. And there's probably because they're young. And so there, there are mechanisms, social mechanisms in place to make people feel shame. Uh, when you take this all into account, you're bound to come to the conclusion that we Athenians consider such behavior the most same shameful thing in the world. In my opinion, however... The fact of the matter is this. As I said earlier, love is, love is, like everything else, complex. 
Considered simply in itself, it is neither honorable nor disgraceful. Its character depends entirely on the behavior it gives rise to. Now that statement is true, but now he's going to finagle the whole thing to present bad behavior as good behavior. To give oneself to a vile man in a vile way is truly disgraceful behavior. By contrast, it is perfectly honorable to give oneself honorably to the right man. Well, that's true, but is this really uh, the right man, or is this actually a vile man presenting themselves as the right man? Right? We have to consider that. Now you may want to know who counts as vile in this context. I'll tell you, it's the common vulgar lover who loves the body rather than the soul. The man whose love is bound to be in, uh, inconstant, since what he loves is itself mutable and unstable. Oh, boy. What do we love in complete friendship? The other person's character. Why? Because it's stable and not mutable, not easily changeable, right? Um, what does he love? He loves the body, this vulgar lover. Number one, his pa it's based on his passions. His passions are going to change from one minute to the next, number one. And number two, the young boy, when he loses the bloom of youth, as they describe it, he's not going to be interested in him anymore. He's going to go find another young one, right? So just, just like the old millionaire who goes and keeps finding the 25-year-old blonde. <clears throat> uh, inconstant, you know, what, what is clearly one a highly valued trait of someone in a love relationship, that they're constant, that they're loyal, and that their, their, their feelings and their obliga feeling of obligation doesn't fluctuate over time. <clears throat> the moment the body is no longer in bloom, he flies off and away. His promises and vows in tatters behind him. Now, wait a second. His promises and vows in tatters behind him? But what has, what has Pausanias said at the bottom of page 16? That lovers are permitted to do anything. They're even permitted by the gods, right? Notice he doesn't take responsibility. He puts it in the hands of the gods. The gods say it's okay for lovers to break their vows because they're permitted to do whatever they want. Right? Uh, how different from this is a man who loves the right sort of character and who remains uh, its lover for life, attached as he is to something that is permanent. To the, he's attached to the character of the other person. What he's actually describing here is complete friendship. But it's only an appearance of complete friendship. It's not the reality. So down the stretch we come here. We can now see the point of our customs that are designed to separate the wheat from the chaff, the proper form, the proper love, from the vile. That's why we do everything we can to make it easy as possible for lovers to press their suits. Now wait a second. It's clearly established that if you want to separate the good people from the... What does he mean by wheat and the chaff? This courtship process is set up to separate the people who are really who really love you versus the people who are just trying to get laid, right? The wham bam, thank you, thank you, man, right? And yet he's actually saying that the rules set up to separate the wheat and the chaff should actually be ones that allow the lover basically to do whatever they want. Now that clearly. You have to use your own logic, folks. You have to look at life and the basic kind of things that happen and say to yourself, that's so obviously wrong because if the lover can do anything and they're dealing with a younger person who is innocent and naive to one degree or another, lacking in the use of reason, lacking, they, they're not aware that people do even do these kinds of things, take advantage of them this way. It's very clear that he is actually establishing rules that will allow for the exploitation of the younger person. And Plato clearly presents that as bad because there's something very ironic going on here. And guess what? The other listeners to the dialogue, this performance, they, they know what Pausanias is saying and they see it for what it is and it's hypocrisy. Uh, that's why we do everything we can to make it as easy as possible for lovers to press their suits and as difficult as possible for young men to comply. 
Uh, it is like a competition, a test to determine uh, to which sort each belongs, right? That's why we have courtship, to find out the truth about what the other person's really up to and about and who they are, right? This explains two further facts. First, why we consider it shameful to yield too quickly. The passage of time in itself provides a good test. The passage of time provides a good test. Over time, all will be revealed. Think about what Aristotle said. If you really want to be friends with someone, you have to know who they are because you have to know what they're really about. Uh, and time is the thing that makes that possible.